Welcome back to Cell Unit Part 3. We're going to talk about the water movement across the selectively permeable membrane. So we're going to discuss osmosis, tonicity, and osmoregulation. Understand that cells must maintain the water balance in order to survive and carry out various physiological functions. So osmosis is defined as passive diffusion of water across the selectively permeable membrane. And water will move from regions of higher water concentration to regions of lower water concentration. So we can actually observe such movement in this laboratory setup. So we use this U-shaped tube, and you can see both of these arms of the tube are separated by a membrane. So on one side of the membrane, we have a lower concentration of solutes, in, case, in this case we have sugar, and then therefore this would be higher concentration of water here. And the other side, the other arm of this tube, will have a higher concentration of solute and therefore lower concentration of water. So now we already established that water moves from regions of higher water concentration to lower. So you can see how we observe the net water movement from left to right, and you can see as a result, the water column is going to be rising. The rising of this water column is going to stop when the pressure exerted by the gravity, which we call hydrostatic pressure, is equal to osmotic pressure. So this side of this tube, here we have pure water in this case, and on this side we have sugar molecules, glucose. So, and you can see how the water movement is happening from left to right because we had more water here since it's pure water and less water here in this solution. So the water column is rising and we can actually measure the height of this water column. So this will represent the osmotic pressure. Another way to estimate or measure the osmotic pressure is by applying force to prevent the water from rising. So you can see here the force has been applied so we can measure and see what does it take for us to stop osmosis from happening? If we take the cells and immerse them in different solutions that have different levels of tonicity, we're going to observe the changes in the shapes of these cells. So for example, if we take a normal animal cell and put that cell in an isotonic solution, water is going to be moving in and out of that cell at equal rates. So the size of the shape of the cell is not going to be affected because the surrounding solution has the same solid concentration as the inside of the cell. Um, if we take a cell and immerse that cell in hypotonic solution, hypotonic solution, notice the water is going to be moving into the cell and the cell could even lyse, meaning burst, because they may not be able to hold all that water that's coming in. The reason this happens because the surrounding solution outside the cell has lower solid concentration. So therefore we have more water and water moves from high concentration to low. So therefore you can see the water movement is into the cell. If we take a cell and place that in hypertonic solution, notice the water is going to leave the cell and the cell as a result is going to shrivel. So in other words, we're going to dehydrate it. Again, why? Because the surrounding solution has higher solute concentration, so it means it has less water, and therefore water moves out of the cell. If we take a look at these um, plant cells, uh, notice these cells, Elodea cells, are sitting in tap water, and you can see all the chloroplasts are dispersed throughout the cells. And then we immerse the cells in salt water. You can see how plasmolysis took place because the membrane separated from the wall and gathered all the cytoplasmic content within. So now what we're going to do, we're going to calculate the water potential. Up until this point, we talked about water and said, here's high concentration of water, here's low concentration of water, and water moves from high to low. This is going to be pretty much the same thing, except we're going to be using different terms. So we're going to refer to water concentration as water potential. So we say water will have high potential, or you will have high water potential and low water potential. So the water is going to move from high to low. The way we calculate water potential is by including the following factors. We actually have more factors, but we're going to be looking at only two. So we have pressure potential and also solute potential. 
when we add those two factors, we will see how those two factors influence the water movement. So in other words, we're going to be able to predict in which direction the water is going to move. So water potential, as I mentioned, it's a physical property that predicts the direction of water movement. And water will move from regions of high water potential to regions of low. The water potential is, in, is measured in units and we call these bars. So now what you want to keep in mind here is that pure water, meaning it has no solutes, will always have a water potential of zero. And then another factor that we have here influencing the water flow is pressure potential. So here's the pressure potential, and this is going to be the physical pressure on a solution. So of course it can be positive and it can be, and can be negative. So one thing I want you to keep in mind is that when you have a scenario and they talk about the open beaker container, that means that open beaker container that contains a solution is going to be subject to atmospheric pressure. So you will always have the pressure potential as zero. Another factor that influences the water movement is the solute potential. This is what we talk about the effect of solutes on the movement of water. So, so how do we actually calculate the solid potential? Well, we do have a formula which is provided to you and you don't have to memorize that. So the first component of solid potential will be ionization constant. So if the substance doesn't ionize in water, meaning does not separate into components, we are going to put one as a number one. For example, glucose, sucrose, it will be one. Because if you put sugar in water, it will remain as this whole molecule. Now, for example, salt, sodium chloride, is going to dissociate into two ions. So therefore, we're going to put a two for ionization constant. And in our, in our lessons and exams, we will mainly deal with either sugar or salt. Um, another component, notice we have here, is the molar concentration of the solute. And then the R, which is the pressure constant, so this number is given to you. And then the temperature, which means temperature is in Kelvin, so if you've been given in Celsius, you need to do the conversion. So all you have to do is multiply all these values and you're going to get your solute potential. And notice it will always going to be a negative number. Solute potential will never be a positive number. It will always be a negative number. Why? Because we established that pure water has a zero water potential. So here it is. This is your zero, and this is what we identify as zero water potential. So it means pure water, no solutes. And then we add the solutes into the water these numbers are going to become negative right here. So I'll say this is minus one, minus two, minus three. So it means we put solutes. Now this number is going to be smaller than a zero. So solute potential will never be positive. It will always be negative because it lowers pure water potential. That number is going to become negative. How so? If you take a look at the solution, and this solution has water and it also has some sugar molecules right here and right here and right here. You can see some of these water molecules are free. They're completely free. So imagine if you did not have any sugar molecules in the solution. So you have nothing but pure water, just individual water molecules. So we say this is high water potential and that water potential is equal to zero. This is as highest level as it can be. So we identify that as zero. Now, when we add the solutes into the water, that means now some of these water molecules are no longer going to be free because notice they are surrounding your hydrophilic molecule here. So this one is not free, this one is not free. The, the, the solute molecules are interacting with water molecules via the hydrogen bond. So it means these water molecules are no longer free. So it means what happened here is we lowered water potential because all these molecules are not free to move. Do you see it? So this is why we say that the, sol the solutes are going to lower the water potential. So let's take a look at pure water here. Notice the water potential is zero megapascals. 
And then we add some sucrose in it and notice we have reduced the water potential to negative 0.244. And if we take a flaccid cell which has a water potential of negative 0.7 and we put in a sucrose solution that we saw on a previous page, negative 0.2, notice the water is going to move into the cell. So this solution here in the beaker is considered hypotonic hypotonic because it's causing the movement of water into the cell. Now what if we take a cell and take the turgid cell that has negative 0.2 water potential and then we add more sucrose into the solution. So notice now we lower the water potential here. Water from the cell is going to move out. Notice because this solution here now going to be called hypertonic. So this is hypertonic because it draws the water out. So here's an illustration of what happens to water potential as we move from the soil to the plant to the atmosphere. So notice in the soil, that's your zero water potential. This is the highest level it can be. And as we go upwards into the plant, into the atmosphere, notice that number becomes more negative and it becomes smaller and smaller. So if we take a look at the plant and see how the water moves through the plant, you will notice that root cells will have negative 0.2 megapascals water potential and then that water potential is decreasing as we go upwards into the atmosphere. This is why we go from the soil into the atmosphere through the plant and the plant is able to transport that water um, against the gravity because remember water molecules are cohesive, adhesive, and then you have the whole capillary action going on there and also that transpirational pull at the leaves. Um, so this is what we observe how water moves from high water potential which is in the soil and then low water potential which is in the atmosphere so we can see the movement of that water so the negative water potential drives water in the plant upwards